Cookies, the world's most influential basketball podcast. A little overcast day here. New York City. Andrew Quo, undeterred. It's almost Halloween. What's going on? I love the fall. I love when it gets dark early. I've been eating lunch and dinner at like, I hit 3.30 this week. Were you exercising after that? Or was that like a... Like what's 3.30 dinner? How does this work schedule-wise? Um, I wake up early. Obviously, this is child-related. But I work out in the morning now. I used to work out at like 2 a.m. at night, like from 2 to 3, because that's just like my biorhythm. But now I just kind of am a morning dog. So the days are getting shorter, and I see people lamenting that on my feed. But as a wash dude... Let the sun set, man. Let the sun set on my day, my dreams. So you just want to be able to get to sleep while it's dark out, is what you're saying? No, I eat, the, yes. But I eat early because the routine of cleaning up and bath time and nap time and stories takes forever. And there's so many random variables that go into it, like tantrums, that... Getting food out of the way is amazing. If they're hungry at like six or seven, just pass off a string cheese, man. All right. We're just going to avoid that whole thing. And we're going to pretend that you've embraced a Mark Wahlberg schedule mm. where you've got to do like three types of martial arts, two ice baths, meditation. We'll get rid of all like the baby food and string cheese. And we'll just pretend that you are incredibly focused because you've got hate crimes to commit against fellow agents. I don't sleep. I just scheme against my ops quietly with my eyes closed for four or five hours at a time. I get a lot. You're mostly yeah, I'm plotting, plotting the downfall of my right. ops, not sleeping. Listen, you can wake me up. I'll be like, fuck the Randall haters. And I'll be like, where am I? I, w- I was in a deep trance. And then filming Transformers number seven. You're, it's not as much about a chicken and the egg. It's more of hatching. Mm. Yo, is Mark Wahlberg going to go down in this Diddy thing? He was one of the the targets of, of the, the frothy MAGA people waiting for the elites to go down. Mark Wahlberg at these freak-offs. We're not... Wait, he was at the freak-offs. At the freak-offs. But like, how come... Yo, what's up with the Mark Wahlberg brand? I know this wasn't on our docket today, but goddamn. No, I just saw like six interns Scrambling. like crumpling up papers, throwing them over their shoulders. Absolutely, I'm waving losing off. their shit because the docket is I'm no waving off my teammates. I'm 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 cooking. Quo, Quo I'm is cooking. going iso ball, iso ball. Cook, cook. Boston wins a fraudulent championship, but where's Mark Wahlberg? Mm-hmm. Um. He is Captain Boston, but they cannot get an expansion WNBA team. Um, During all this Boston branding of late, he's just been absent. Is he trying to hmm, disassociate himself from, from that culture and trying to become a bigger star? Or is he retreating and pulling like an oasis and being being dormant for a while just for his big comeback in Transformers number 12 or Ted number 7. That was more than I've thought about this, but I will say I have considered this idea of the Wahlberg brand because he was sort of poised to become a huge he action did, he, star. He did it. He was in one of our favorite mm-hmm. movies of all time, Sniper. I like that one. Fantastic movie. Great movie. He was an engaging role player in The Departed. And like it felt as if he was able to be one of these like Boston lore guys. But then it sort of slipped away. I feel like I see a lot of TV shows or movies with Wahlberg as the star that have no particular burn. Hmm. 
he was the number one grossing actor for years and he was in he launched the transformers franchise which ends up being like a big blockbuster moneymaker right like Bruckheimer's still at it he left obviously but uh, I think Wahlberg fulfilled his racist promise. He became the king of Hollywood, the, the freakiest of the freak offs. Also, I, I guess I, yeah, yeah, that's that's what I was thinking. Um, but no, I, I guess time comes for us all, right? Other than Tom Cruise, yeah, because Will Smith, Will Smith, he he was that guy. And he was supposed to be the action star of the future. I mean, again, they they fulfilled that promise, but then they just kind of slipped off the mountain. It's just Tom Cruise, due to the fact that he runs faster than anybody else in cinematic mm-hmm. history. And he, he's, but unfortunately, he sleeps. He doesn't. Mark Wahlberg doesn't need to sleep. And uh, but your your point is taken because there's that new Apple movie with Clune Dog and Brad Pitt. And they're getting kind of long in the tooth, right? Um, but that is a, a reuniting of two of the main characters in the Oceans franchise, which I don't enjoy, but because I associate those two guys with other franchises or movies. And they kind of are in the position that Reese Witherspoon is in now, where they kind of produce and curate their own careers because they have the capital culturally and monetarily, right? Mark Wahlberg has that. Why isn't he writing the story of and starring in the movie about Pistol Pete? Right. Or, I mean, someone like Affleck has done that. He's like, hey, I'm going to famously those guys make movies yeah. and... Right. I, I'm also just thinking of other Boston guys. I'm giving a, you know, a, yeah. more leprechauns. Well, I, I mean, Damon, but yeah, Wahlberg, I actually not sure exactly what he's been doing lately, but I, I guess there was that Apple show. Mm-hmm. It's funny you mentioned the other mm-hmm. one, Wolves, whatever. Well, been like, to me, it should have been called Lone, Lone Wolves because that would have mm-hmm. been funnier. Or, because isn't that the premise anyway? Maybe it was, maybe that's a little too hitting the nail on the head. I thought Lone Wolf. Don't spoil it for me nice. because Clooney as Carl Anthony Towns is going to be so cool. Don't spoil it. No spoilers. Brad Pitt as Anthony Edwards. Woo. Oh. Yeah. Oddly enough. <laughs> oh. Oddly enough. I was walking through hmm. Chinatown. I can't remember what street that it's shot on. It's like, but you know when you go down Moscow, I, I want to say, and then there's like, it hits... No, it's not the one that curls. It's another one that's right in that right in that vicinity, though, like that that mm-hmm. section. And uh, I was walking down there, and I they're like, "Hey, hold on!" And they race this car down the street really, really fast. And I was like, "Oh, okay." I didn't know what they were filming, but there was a whole crew there. But you know, we couldn't walk down that street because they were just whipping this car down that street mm. over and over again. And I saw it on the little monitor, you know, after it went by. I was happened to be standing next to him. And then when I saw the trailer for Wolves, I'm like, there it is. Mm. I I thought I would never see it again. And I looked, and I'm like, I was looking through the monitor at this scene as it was shot. Very and cool. That's it. Whether, you know, it's just like the a little taste of Hollywood, Andrew. It was like exciting. Screech and peel off into a Peking pork chop house on Doyers. Do they recreate the scene from New Jack City? I think everyone ends up over at the mm. river. With number one Celtics fan, Matt McCauley. Mm, oh, he's not going to want to hear that. And he does not appreciate that. that. No, no, he's truly a Knicks guy. Well, I know. It's like, is Eric Adams a, a Nets fan? Uh, what are we going to find out about our prominent New Yorkers like Matt McCauley and Eric Adams? Well, the, the two mayors, the one you of the city know. overall and the, the one of and mm-hmm. the one of downtown. Shout out to Airy Weapons. Um, yeah. So yeah, so your boy Eric Adams, the Czar King, under yeah the indictment. Rat star. And this followed a week. This followed a week where the whole administration basically resigned. I feel like I almost resigned out of solidarity. Mm. Resigned myself to a future of lawless New York. Have you ever felt this? Uh, disconnected from your government, Andrew. <laughs> well, my gosh. Like, 
everyone compares him to Mayor Dinkins because obviously Dinkins was the first black mayor and uh, Eric Adams is the second. The Dinkins era was like, I remember talking to my father about it. He was like, it's not totally safe, but it's fun. Like there's a lawlessness that like my father was like, it's kind of why we love this city. Like Times Square is still kind of shitty and like there are um, weird pockets of uh dangerous neighborhoods but interesting things that come from low rent um you know i think about Koch, the party animal the first party animal maybe uh the origin of eric adams you know Koch would big fan of cindy lopper was into celebrity studio 54 uh and then you got the talk about boston heads you got your boy uh, de blasio and then bloomberg so is Eric Adams an amalgamation of all these human beings? Hmm. Is he the final boss of these dudes? Giuliani, I'm skipping. Clearly Giuliani DNA in there. Yeah, I was going to say, I think because of the law enforcement background, Giuliani would be the obvious Comparison. But Giuliani wasn't like on the town as much. That's a Mayor Koch thing, right? No, this is true. De Blasio sort of out on the bit. town. Like he might have been on. He, you know, now he's out there on hinge dates. The lying stuff, part of like De Blasio, before, the straight up lying part, is part of Eric Adams' brand. We talked a lot about De Blasio. The, how he kind of resembled a flamingo, this big bird, just this gawky guy. I'm like, maybe we just didn't really respect, you know, the stretch four mm. during that period of time. I mean, in hindsight, what do you want in a mayor? Because I think, in my opinion, New York is as unlivable as it's ever been in terms of like rent and money and working. But like, it, it's pretty safe. I don't know what we want. Um, de Blasio was hilarious. Adams is clearly the funniest mayor of our lifetime, right? Like, do we mm, do we want him absolutely. to go? Well, to me, the main thing with mayor is like, it's slightly different from president because I don't know that the mayor has that much work to do. Mm-hmm. Like, I think you can get away with not doing much work as mayor. I mean, I guess you can do it as president as well. Let me let me stand corrected on that. But generally speaking, a funny mayor is great. A mayor that goes out is great. A mayor that is a public presence, that's great. The stuff with like cutting off money to libraries, less great. Embezzling $10 million and then the city matching that, giving a prime piece of real estate to the country of Turkey. Um you know, but he's done annoying things like made it harder for our homies to like open up clubs and stuff. I think. Well, yeah, there was. Well, I mean, there was the the allegations against was it the brother of the nightlife czar? One one of the one of the police guys. Yeah, not even the nightlife czar. It was like basically an old fashioned patronage shakedown organization. It's like, all right. The cops are going to come and bust your place up unless you pay me off and I'll tell yeah. them not to hassle you. I mean, it's just straight up like yeah. protection money racket. Because like, yeah, I mean, I feel like that is a constant in any city, but especially in New York City. And the allegations that are pointed at Adams, the first things that they talked about, and we, I have not read the entire indictment, but, you know, taking... <laughs> taking a lot of upgrades, uh, flights from like credit card stuff, being allowed into the Chase Sapphire Club, in the garden, but like Turkey g- giving him hotel rooms, uh, uh, first class tickets, um, in, in on on paper that kind of stuff may seem like it is an assumed perk of being a powerful politician. But at the same time, the debate of our political lifetime is the idea of quid pro quo, right? Like, how do you get somebody for this kind of nebulous idea? I mean, I know someone who 
owns multiple nightclubs who immediately started doing Eric Adams fundraisers. Mm -hmm. I don't believe the person who owns this is, has a lot of interest in Eric Adams as mayor or his policies. It's like, oh, if this guy's going to be mayor. I should be throwing fundraisers for them. And therefore, that will help out Eric my Adams establishment. Like, Please throw me a fundraiser. I mean, Sounds good. He's like, yeah, and we won't shut yeah. your place down. I mean, is right? this just politics? I mean, I'm saying, right. I don't know if it was that explicit. Well, in part, I guess the thing that makes local politics feel weirder is that this is all the exact same stuff that happens on a national level. It's like, hey, the pharmaceutical companies are giving all this money to all the Democrats and they're not going to be in favor of, you know, mm -hmm. universal health care. Yeah. You're like, oh, right. That's the way the system works. And we're like, so this guy, he gave the mayor a small bundle of change and they, the cops didn't come down and bust up the people on the sidewalk at 3.30. I mean, Clarence Thomas is like, what's the problem? What's here? the difference? Sounds like an ethical man. He should be on the Supreme Court. Um. Yeah, I uh, Eric Adams has given us so much. Like even fuel for legendary SNL skits. Like the, some of the best. So like Missoula, however much I don't want to like him, like what a wonderful soundbite. I love it. And Eric Adams for a while on this exact podcast there was like what stupid stuff did Eric Adams do this week? And we could just find something good. I mean, I remember my one encounter with him at a Met Gala after party. He was kind enough to indulge me with a quote. I asked him some innocuous question. And he said, the Met Gala needed more swag. So they brought me in for the swag. They had swag, but I added to the swag. I said, great. <clears throat> It's going in the paper record. His, the swag is, yeah, the Mark swag down. was was evident with him, but he didn't really kind of, he was really into Zero Bond, uh, Christmas restaurant, Italian restaurants, Carbone. I forget the, his number one restaurant, but he never really sat courtside that much at the at Barclays or, or MSG. And his passion was rats. That was his passion. And I always felt like that was such a great comedic bit because there's no bigger rat in New York City than Eric Adams, even the inflatable Johns. But I thought that was such a a clever comedic obsession of his. I mean, he is extremely, extremely funny. And sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's not. Who, who can say? And for that, I, I, am gra I'm, I have gratitude. Like, you gave us laughs. But the main issue is that if you look at the entire administration, like, th those problems were inherently tied to him giving people jobs that he just wanted to have jobs, whether there were no show, whether they were, whether it was cronyism, like, you know, you kind of can't have a functioning government when it's just like a buddy system, you know, yeah. like it's just, a, it, you're just not going to be running that tight of a ship if it's like, Hey, all right, we've got a front office that's just made of my former I teammates. I mean, has this not been going on for generations? Didn't didn't Pacey from Dawson's Creek star in a movie called The Skulls? I mean, it's been going on like forever. thousands of years, I mean, right? This is like the... I mean, right, but yeah, even right. within New York City, like mm -hmm. Boss Tweed, like the... the I mean, this is how gov civic yeah. government... It's basically and, you know, there, forever. We always mention the, the theory that's been disproved, but I kind of love to think about if you want the best people in society to work in government, you have to pay them more, you have to incentivize them. And like the that got me thinking to like if the if some of the appeal that Eric Adams has or accepts from being mayors, like the attention, the the 
lifestyle, the um, the social media chatter around him, he seems to enjoy quite a bit. Did we create this monster? Are we the traffic? Well, I don't know, because I look at the way that these elections have worked. It's like he is democratically voted. Yeah, yeah I mean, New York is a unique case because Curtis Lee was never going to win. Um, but even though he tries, respect to the Slee dog, slowed Slee dog. But, but what I mean is, but it wasn't the same as, you know, the Democratic Party's complete aversion to democracy. There, there was a ranked election and you had multiple candidates and, you know, those are, wasn't there a runoff or, or I forget how it worked exactly with that, the, that system, but, you know, it was ranked. You could vote for whoever you wanted. He wasn't necessarily the, the party guy. There, there was a few people in there that the Democratic Party probably was fine with as well. And once who had ties to corporations and, and so on, you know, I mean, he was obviously not an outsider because he no, was, he was an insider borough president yeah. before that. I mean, yeah. I mean, he, yeah. he is the he was insider, kind of a yeah. semi surprise, not for people who followed the election, but he wasn't talked about that much until the end. It's like, oh, damn, the cop won. Huh. The crooked cop from New Jersey actually right. won. I was like, oh, I should have voted, I guess. Oh, the premio yeah. voters. I um, got it. But I don't know. I mean, the it's hard to glean kind of like a Shakespearean narrative from his downfall, alleged downfall. Today he claims like it. he's going to reign. He used this word reign. My reign will continue, he said, or I'm going to continue to reign. That's a... He is amazing. Quote. All the quotes are good. I don't think he has a bad quote, right? Like Trump is incredible in his own way. It is not a genius. It is not some way to kind of spin a brand, but it works. And uh, Eric Adams is takes all the things we hate the most and turns it into something we will miss, in my opinion. If he goes down, he might not go down. He might get off. So who is next in the line of succession here? It's that guy, probably someone you like, like that. Um, I don't want to label him. Yeah. Is it Jumani, Jumani, yes, Jumani next, Williams? Uh, he has to declare a runoff, I think, within the first week. And then um, they, there's a small re-election. He's not just... Yeah, Jumani's fun. He's fun by me. He's, I like that. I read his stats when that was all going on. It like, seems like a Dietrich guy. Um, I don't know. Big big Knicks fan. I think big Knicks fan. Mm. And anyone but was De Blasio? Uh, yeah, he was a Celtics fan. He was an open Celtics fan. Um, so it's yeah, he's from Boston. I'll, same with Bloomberg, who just pretended I mean, to be a. Adams fan. never declared his allegiance to the Nets, even though we know he has that chess piece, that New Jersey Nets tattoo. You know he has one. Um, but it, it, I, I'm trying to segue indelicately to like humanizing people that are just the worst. Like we don't like politicians. We don't like cops. We don't like power hungry people, but we kind of love Eric Adams. Industry ended last night on HBO. Somehow humanizing four or five characters that were just all the worst. So I've been getting my fix of British TV from Slow Horses, which is, I think, four episodes into, I don't know, six or eight. You, meanwhile, are just concluding Industry Season 3. You've made some wild declarations. Best show since Sopranos was one. I, I just told hearing. you before the show. Yes, yes. Defend. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, yeah, no. Like you said, you said yeah, it to me like uh, 10 minutes ago. Um, defend this, this statement that you made 10 to 12 I minutes mean, ago. If we're going to elevate a show like Succession to the point in which we did, and only because it's about finance, we can like kind of refer to industry in the same conversation. 
because it's about stock markets, it's about power, it's about media, whatever. Um, the first two seasons of industry were kind of about young people trying to be successful and their proclivities, their, their freakishness in terms of power, money, and relationships. And then the third season got like extremely serious as if the writers were like, should we write a great show? Should we just do it and like make these characters twice as complex than they were before? And it kind of hit me really hard because it was like a fun show with interesting characters. And then it became a show we have to talk about with the great shows. I didn't like Succession that much, but, and I think like The Sopranos and The Wire shouldn't be like talked about like these biblical shows. Like they had flaws too. I'm not saying like comparing anything to The Sopranos is blasphemy because that show wasn't perfect by any means, but it was great, probably top five all time. So this industry, this season, kind of crazy um the characters were complicated and they hated each other and they didn't hate each other and they backstabbed each other but they didn't and you ended up like rooting for them as a team as a whole it, it was really weird good writing kind of annoying writing like there were some sorkin sorkinisms in there uh, and how can there not be because of the the cliche of Wall Street and the the trading floor, and I mean that that was that was my objection with mm -hmm. Succession. I thought it was good, it's funny, it's well written, but after a while, the the snappiness just became the show. It overwhelmed the stakes to me. So maybe industry that has not been the case in the third season, as you're describing. I have not been up on the show, but to me, it was hard to take anything Succession did seriously because it felt like The Simpsons where no matter what happens, really, we're going to start from scratch the, at, at mm -hmm. every episode. I know there are running plot lines, but ultimately it doesn't really matter. Like the stakes are just there to be rearranged so that the jokes are different. Yeah, yeah. and Succession, and we're going to talk about Zach Lowe and ESPN and media in the basketball hour of this podcast, perfect podcast. But forgive me if I sound a little hokey, but I think like when you make a show, an artist do whatever, they have a choice at something beautiful or not. And I feel like industry, you know, the shots were fine. The, 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 the rhythm and the vibe and the pace were, were, it was a TV show. But they delved into trying to dig up some complexity that I thought was kind of beautiful that Succession did not. And there was, there's a risk there and it's not perfect industry did not nail it necessarily but the attempt the effort i thought was pretty awesome to watch and um i don't know what we want from our tv maybe we want succession and the one-liners or dragons dying from other dragons that they can't see around the corner the fuck is that oh a dragon i'm dead now it's like aren't there only seven dragons like yeah well one killed one because it was hiding behind a rock anyway um I thought uh, industry, industry's attempt at something beautiful was kind of some, uh, it, it gave me pause. It, it, it was something to note. When did you just pause? Gave no, me? not, not pause like rap pause, but gave me an artistic pause. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you know, is, yo. It, gave me. Is pause is TV sus? Is our hour long dramas? Hmm, anyway, um, but like slow horses, don't I, fuck me in the air and call it a reach around. Right. Damn it! I'm I'm also caught up on slow horses, which to me doesn't have the same impact. I liked first two seasons of Slow Horses quite a bit. I thought the third season, which from my understanding was actually shot at the same time as the one that's currently on, like they, they did three and four, even though it's a different story, different plot, there's some different characters, they shot them simultaneously. So, or back to back, whatever, but three, I thought became kind of stupid with all due respect to that show being smart and funny. 
in in a different way than I think we're talking about with Succession. Um, but the third one was too action packed. It was just guys running around, lots of gunplay. The fourth one has gotten more back on, I think, espionage. Yeah, it's a little gritty. It's it's grittier. It's slower. There's, there's, there's more tension. Yeah. there's more mysteries. So I've I've enjoyed this this series uh, quite a bit. Or this season of the series. If it's six episodes and not eight or not 10, which I'm not totally sure what it is, I'll be a little bit disappointed because I wouldn't say a whole lot of stuff has happened yet. Mm. It's mostly been, you know, no, I'm okay with like the not having a lot of action. I mostly mean there haven't been too many twists and you kind of know where they're going with it. But I do like Slow Horses quite a bit because I just think Gary Oldman is awesome. I hate his character on there, the slob, the thing. It's just like pretending the alcoholic as an aging thespian gets my goat a little bit. Um, obviously, he's one of the greats. But I I like the first episode of season four so much. No spoilers or spoilers, depending on how you look at the word. Uh, um, <laughs> and, and, Depending on how you how you gauge no spoilers is meaning that there aren't going to be spoilers or there are. Right. It's like the... What's what's that word that has two meanings? Definitely, or uh, what did Webster define in both ways? Anyway, um, the first episode there was a who done it. It's like there was a murder, and it was like, but who did the murder? And was it a main, a character we care about? Are they are they gone? Sort of like what they did in, in season one with Olivia Cook, and it made me. I love that episode. And it made me think of like Wayne Wang's like Chan is missing and Jonathan Price going senile in season four and being an untrustworthy character. I was like, oh, this would be cool if they don't have to make the whole show season this. But what if Jonathan Price kind of floated around and they were searching for him the whole time? Like, that's kind of it's kind of cool. That's a great idea. And he's wandering in and out of hotels. Like, have you found this guy? He's the key to all this bullshit. It's like, yeah, he's not himself lately. I thought that would have been a really cool allegory for British politics. Mm, and then they wouldn't really have been alive or dead. They would have been floating around in some sort of spongy connective tissue between the afterlife and but the this was coil. the joke right because is the character river alive or dead and the river has is the main character in that in the odyssey right his name is river they're like was is river alive i'm like right somebody has read the odyssey i have not thus far everything is coming back to the river this episode <laughs> i mean it could the the hudson river Um, but yeah, I mean, slow, you said the word stupid, which was funny because I think this show, the slow horses drags a little bit with characters I don't care about, but then I was like, slow, what if these band of misfits are all kind of versions of Jonathan Price's character and they're all for sake of a lesser bomb? What if they're all the R bomb and they're all running around with no tether to reality? And it's actually a comedy in the vein of like a very serious Benny Hill. My main issue with Slow Horses thus far as a series has been that it feels as if every, other than maybe even season two, everything just comes back to the the corruption is inside the building, which is obviously a theme here that your enemies are really people who are on the internal side at one point or the other and that shifting allegiances and all these operations that there are ramifications of ones from the past. Sure. But it's always kind of like a cover up within the, within the building, within the, what do they call it? The station, the farm, whatever it's called. The, what, yeah. the, what do they call it? The carriage? The desk. The, yeah. the, the desk. Yeah. The carriage house, the desk, the, yeah. the blunderbuss. Something with the the oh, the the lorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to bring this back to industry, are we the baddies? Another reference to an incredible British show, Peep Show. I mean, that's the joke, right? It's just like we're trying to figure out 
which one of these vicious stockbrokers is going to be victorious and who we're rooting for. And I'm like, they all suck. <laughs> They're all the worst, actually. Everyone in the show is the worst. Everyone in Slow Horses is like, I'm a cop. And I'm like, ah, oh, right. I mean, this is the wire. Right. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I've been thinking about the wire a little bit lately because of some thoughts I've had about Zach Lowe and mm. Grant Land and basketball writing. So we're going to get back to that. But yeah, that's been, that's been floating around like a re-roundables around my head over and over and over. Um, so, so you're known for eating all types of items hey, and be, be unorthodox careful. locations. Be careful with the, my lunch was the smelliest, Places smelliest lunch in, in the cafeteria. It's just garlic. It's just garlic. All right. Let's, let's hold on. Let's address this real quick. Right. I've, I've, I've we have, we've heard the story about the Asian kid who grows up around white kids and their food and their lunch is made fun of, of. and this is part of like the lore of, of many Asian people involved in food. It's part of the backstory, but other people have said it's not particularly true. It's like an imagined memory. It's an implanted memory of how you were treated as a child. What's the real I think truth? We've had here? Th this exact debate on a previously perfect pod. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I mean, and maybe it wasn't perfect the last um, time, or maybe this is more I'm trying perfect. to dig up a, a, a David Chang take I had because he had done something, not win family feud on the back of friend of the pod, Pablo Torres, amazing bonus round, but the idea of ugly delicious an idea of like misunderstanding cuisines. Um, I think it's, I, I vacillate back and forth. I think it's valid. Like now that I'm packing my child's lunch, I am conscious not to put like fried noodles in there or things that would smell the place up because I want him to have it less trauma than he could have. But is it character building? I don't know. I had a few of those moments where like, Ooh, the leftovers from last night are not flying in this cafeteria. But I told my mom and then she switched up her whole game and started making me sandwiches and, you know, turkey sandwiches and whatnot. It was easy as that. Um, but I thought about it yesterday because I saw somebody as the baseball season's winding down dining on half a dozen oysters in Camden Yards in Baltimore, Maryland, talking about the wire. Um and people being like, that is disgusting. You do not eat raw oysters at a baseball game. And my thought was, why the hell not? Don't have a hard and fast take on this. Was so someone who goes up to Rochester and you go to their every stadium, they've got garbage plates. You want to get garbage plates while watching the Red Wings, the AAA baseball team, or the you know Americans who are the farm team for the Sabres. It's there. You can get a plate of, well, of bacteria swill. Bacteria is not famously attached to fried food, right? It is, but it isn't. This could, I'm saying this could be this could be true. I only mean if if we're going to allow for regional delicacies and say that oysters and crabs and seafood are inherently part of the culture of Maryland and Baltimore, then I think you allow more leeway than if it was say a landlocked place like mm -hmm. Denver. I mean, I thought it was interesting because it wasn't attached to a race. Oh, this is why I thought about it because of they're eating the dogs, they're eating the cats, the pets. And it got back to Haitians kind of culture, but also Asian stuff that we've heard a million times before, especially in my lifetime. But um, either embracing that or deflecting that is a choice you have uh, as someone who just eats normal ass food. But it is a cultural thing, right? And these oysters are not attached to a minority. Because as you said, they're, it's a part of the DNA of Maryland, the best oysters come from those bays, in my opinion. 
but I don't eat oysters anymore because I think they're disgusting and they're alive. And I don't want to eat things that are alive, even though cooking them somehow makes it better for me. But um, the, the, the context of this matters, right? Because I imagine 20 years ago, sushi in an arena or stadium would have been disgusting. Right. I want to go back to this idea of oysters being alive. Like we know they are. What's their cognition level? Is it different from like asparagus? Or, or a fern that kind of senses fear and closes up when you touch it, which means it has right. some sort of defense mechanism, therefore a nervous system. And we should not willy nilly just assume that plants don't have things that mushrooms and oysters have, which is a really, really basic. Right. I, I don't think it has a nervous central, ner central nervous system of a, but of some variety. This is right? weird. You know how like a military bomb, what do you call them? Disarm people like uh, people who uh, um, go check out a suitcase if it's a bomb and they have the, the robotic creatures that they hold and they have trauma when those creatures blow up or, one of their legs falls off and because they personify their emotions with these objects. And if you told me oysters felt fear because when you open them up, they try to close to order in order to preserve themselves, I would believe you. Right. And we know pearls are derived from mussels, a, a certain species of mussels that are trying to protect themselves against this invader inside their space. And it forms these beautiful round orbs, but it is, there are beautiful objects that are made from fear, right? I mean, yes. I always think about this with people talking about veganism. It's like, yeah, but we're going to do a problem if plants have feelings, just kind of, Dude, sure, I, I stopped eating mushrooms. I'm not sure what those are. I don't know what kind of pain those aliens are feeling, but I know they created soil and the earth and fungi is really complex. So I stopped eating mushrooms conveniently. What about, I don't think they taste that good anymore. But what about the mass murder you commit eating a bowl of rice? Thousands of bacteria dying, splashing in the acids of my stomach. Universes. Each grain, each grain suffering more than the and last. And the time it takes to get from the bowl to my stomach is maybe like a trillion years in rice, rice bacteria calendars, right? So like a hundred years on this planet, I don't know, we have to ask Obi Toppin how he feels about it, feels like a lifetime but maybe we're just on our way. We're in a big bowl of rice getting ready to be poop. How do you get rid of vermin in your home? Not to say that it is infested with vermin, but it's New York City and vermin enter your home at some point, whether it's roaches or rats or silverfish or spiders or, well, spiders aren't really vermin. They're kind of, they're, they're really sick. Being but sick. point being, how, if, if you are... I mean, yeah, like sick, like, yeah, yeah, spiders are sick. It's like that's Young Thug's yeah. clothing brand. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're guilty about eating mushrooms, how do you get rid of a fly? I try to let them out. I eat meat, but I try to let flies out. I had a, a mouse problem in my place in the Lower East Side for years. So I kept takeout containers, those quart containers, and pieces of cardboard nearby, mm -hmm. which is not a problem. Uh, and then I would scoop them up. But then I didn't know where to put them because if I take them outside to the main streets of Eldridge. But you would like scoop them up, you would scoop them up off the floor. Like you would cut find them, them and catch them. On top and then slide a piece of cardboard underneath them. Turn the. the but how are you, how are you getting close enough to catch them? I'm, I'm you just You corner them by and that. walk up to them. Like they're not that slick. Um, so if I hear a mouse, it would take like, sometimes it would take. 20 minutes. Sometimes it would not take 20 minutes, but I just like put a cup down, a plastic cup down, slide the thing underneath and go outside with them. 
Eldridge Street is not like safer than my apartment. I would put them next to like the park on Christie. And I'm like, is this where they want to be? They kind of want to be in my cupboard, dining on basmati rice, chewing through bags of oatmeal, right? So I don't know what the right way to do it. Basically, everything I do in my life, I have to justify by making myself like feel better than not feeling better. So I think taking them outside and putting them in a park is better than I don't have the stomach to stomp them out. I really don't. No, I understand that. Like when I had a mouse and told the super, I was like, all right, you know, you know, mouse proof the place or put some traps on it. They threw down some glue traps. I'm like, oh, I hate those. They're, they're so cruel. And I I left them there. And then a few days later, I found a a mouse in the closet that had gone on one and I felt really bad. And I mean, I hate, I hate glue traps. I know how cruel they are, but just seeing the mouse, he was, he had died at that point because they have really fast metabolisms. But I, I was like, that's not cool. I need live catch traps. You can get those, right? Yeah. I don't, I don't want to. Yeah. You no, know I'm saying I don't want to, I don't want to hurt I mean, the little guys. Yeah. But if you, if, but, but if you're going to dispatch them, I think you got to go classic <laughs> snap. Like if you're going to do it, you got to You got to be breaking the neck immediately. You can't be putting them on a glue trap or drowning them. It's you just have too, to have a too perfectly mean. carved wedge of Swiss with holes in them with the aroma going through the air and a cat a tuxedo cat and then you'll you'll see the mouse actually and the mouse will actually be traveling as if carried by a current of of that Mm -hmm. wafting smell with his nose in the air and his feet actually no longer doing the worm in the air as we talked about last episode um yeah i told you recently last month i had a rat infestation in my backyard because they're doing construction down a few doors down And my neighbor was like, listen, out of solidarity, I paid for an exterminator. Can you do it too? So like it actually works because you, you know, rats just like move around. You can't, can't really get rid of them if you're the the lone wolf. So I did out of solidarity and the, uh, the exterminator was really frustrated because I was like, I know this is outside, but can you not put poison around? Cause sometimes like there's a stray cat that, I feed and it's cool. I don't want him to or her to get into anything. And can you not like destroy property? Can you just like send them away from my zone and have someone else deal with them? And they're just like, so what do you want us to do? They just put bricks everywhere around the holes and that's it. They're gone. Like, can you just yell at the rats? Can you get Mayor Adams up in here? Give him a good scaring. I mean, running. I, I was like, th- this was the, th- then they said something scandalous to me. I was like, can you tell me if I have rats in my house? And they walk through and they're like, you don't. I'm like, how did you do that? Just by going into my basement. And they were like, well, you can smell the urine. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And they're hmm. like cobwebs, if there's cobwebs, they're not here because they're not running around the corners. And I would be able to smell it immediately. And he was like, you know, when you walk through Chinatown and I was like, you motherfucker. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Yep. Yep. I got you. You ass. Okay. Right. You're like, how, how dare you inform me of the exact smell that I know. Get out of my house. Oh, good point. Good point. I got, I got it. Oh, you, oh, like Forlini's. Right. Right. Exactly. Like the smell of Forlini's. Sir, I know a four hourly worker when they come into my house through the shit they take in my bathroom immediately. It goes both ways, young man. <laughs> Has an exterminator Hi, been here? Uh, I'm the exterminator. <laughs> uh, do you have a bathroom I can use? I'm like, right here, young man. Right this way. No, no, I'm, I'm saying you can do exactly what he does. Just That's what I mean. with exterminators. I'm just like, yeah. there must be somebody hourly in my place working, clocking their 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 schedule by the waft of feces that is floating right you know not like china it smells not like chinatown 
It's rough, man. But I knew exactly what they were talking about. It's like, you know that spell? And kind of what we did earlier in the pod. They're like, you know that street that curves? I'm like, Doyers. I'm like, yeah, the smell of that street. I'm like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I do. That's not human piss. They're like, that is not human piss. That is a rodent piss. You're like Wahlberg. You have a I was also, I forget. I was thinking about Wahlberg because people were trying to figure out what rights Donald Trump had as a business owner and also a convicted felon, which was a Wahlberger issue. They couldn't get a liquor license because Mark Wahlberg had blinded an Asian man in his youth. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's also an issue with bands sometimes when you're taking people on tour. If you have a felony for a long time, you couldn't get into Canada. Yeah. I don't know if that's changed, but that was certainly an issue. I mean, for a I while. can't really vouch for all of the funky bunch. There's how can No, you, you can. I'll how? I'll I'll let you do that. I'll let you vouch for how? the entire funky bunch, from funky bunch member A to but member Z. Funky's on a spectrum, right? But what's funky to me and what's too funky for the government? Oysters? Rotten right. oysters in a ballpark? I mean, that makes sense. I mean, I, I guess I'm more thinking of like, what is funkiness Of course a it's a spectrum. Politics is a spectrum. Sexuality is a spectrum. Fandom is a spectrum. And funkiness is a spectrum. On the one side, you have the funky worm. The other side, mm-hmm. you have the funky it's bunch. It's the diametrically, diametric extremes of funk. The worm and the bunch. Living for the funk, right, right. dying for the funk. On a scale on from opposite sides. one to bunch, what are you? On mm. a scale from worm to bunch. Like kind of like a neoliberal mm-hmm. version of funk, are you like a right down the center. Like, I think I'm a funk centrist. I'm a funk conservative. Were you mm. really into... Were you into funk as a, as a genre? It. Disco funk, not for me. Catch me at a Mets stadium burning disco records. I've never been a funk head either. And I don't know if this is tied in some parts to when there was beef between East Coast and West Coast mm-hmm. rappers. And the West Coast sound was that of Funkadelic and Parliament, and that was associated with West Coast rap. And I'm like, give me that RZA, give me that, give me that primo. Who are not not funky? They're I on never the really funk loved, spectrum. I never really. They're on the funk spectrum, but I never really loved those like Atomic Dog samples that much. I mean, are you a George Clinton fan? Uh, not really. I interviewed him once and he was really nice. I I liked him quite a bit. I was in Tallahassee, Florida, and we went down there. This was following his arrest for uh, smoking crack in a car. And he got there, we got there in the morning and he was slow to rise and kind of lumbered out around for a while, but then he warmed up and he was great, really funny. And it's like, so what's the story with you smoking crack in the car? And he's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, what's, I mean, you know, just what's, how did it end up there? He's like, well, crack is great. Oh, oh, okay. Crack gets Say good less. reviews. I mean, we've been through this years ago, but alcohol gets terrible reviews. Yeah. Heroin gets the best reviews. And crack below that, Coke gets middle reviews, right? Shout out to the industry. Yeah. I, oh, yeah. For me, Coke is like, a funk centrist. Yeah, because sure. sometimes when people have Coke, just personally speaking, and they offer it to me, which I politely decline, but they're just like, eh, you're probably better off. Like the hangover sucks. The high is nice, but if it's not for you, it could be miserable. And I'm like, that's not a good review. No, thank you. Yeah, I think freebasing and, and heroin are like super People have funky. offered me heroin being like, it is incredible. You'll never be the same. I'm like, that is a good review. It's like... It is worth it if you want to do it. You didn't have that atomic no, dog. Oh no, my I am I am on the funk worm scale. 
Woo, put me right next to worm. That's scary. Scary, man. Where were were we trying to get back to the whole thing of eating oysters in a ballpark? Are we long gone on that one? Have you ever had an oyster high? I felt like you had a. I felt like you had a point that you wanted to get, get to that we never got to. But am I am I just misinterpreting? You might that? be. Um, it is. Well, the idea of shame on social media is interesting to me, because when the person posted that image of oysters, they had to expect the comments would be like, that's disgusting. I would never do it. Gross, gross, gross. Eating cats, eating dogs. So, sorry, sorry, sorry. Just, gonna, just to cut you off here. What, what did it look like for, the, for those who haven't seen it? Delicious. Such as myself. I mean, I, you know, when I think of oysters, I think of like ice and there, there being oysters, you know, assorted gracefully in, 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 in semicircles around it. You've got some little containers of, of sauces and, and lemon, is that what yeah. we? Is that what it, it was in like? a plastic, um, uh, like fry tray with like a decorative napkin with huge oysters? Uh, you had your um, cocktail sauce, a wedges of lemon. It looked nice. Huge oysters, like big, the size of, um, like a, well, it's like a, a saucer or a cup. What do you call those things when you put under the cups? Anyway, um, coaster. Coaster. Um, yeah, it looked nice. But the outrage is interesting because it reminded me of the Trump Haitian accusation, which we know is like all false now. They're just like, well, we had to make that up to get you guys interested. And like, right. But um, like hot dogs are the strangest thing in a ballpark, right? That is the strangest food item at a sports uh -huh. venue. Because no one really knows what it is. Like, tell me what a hot dog is. It's a bunch of ground meat. Like, what meat? It's like, well, it's a, it's a cow. It's an all beef hot dog. Like, well, what part of the cow are we talking about? An ear or a fillet? It's like, oh, well, it's a bit of everything. I'm like, an oyster is an oyster, right? That's just a whole food. Well, sure, uh, but I mean, I think the. Uh the ambiguity of hot dogs are what have allowed it to become such a, a key part and of American culture. And the fact that they're so delicious. In a way that, they're the, so delicious. Oh, well, the delicious part is is is, is part yeah. and parcel of this. But I just mean sausages don't have that same cachet here in part because we know what it is a sausage is. Sometimes. Sometimes. We right? assume so. We trust the people who but, tell us what it is. But, right. You can tell. You can tell. But I mean, why is a hot dog... But why is the hot dog so much more American than the sausage? Is it simply because it's processed in a it's way easier that easier to consume, like makes it, and but also appeals to our American sensibilities, which are we love processed stuff, we love artificial things, or at least, or we have right. And this comes down to the guilt issue, right? If we quote unquote process it, trust the process enough to have the end be a hot dog it is few more steps away from eating a steak, which is kind of identifiable as muscle tissue that comes from an animal that is not too dissimilar than your pet Lassie, you know? Um, but if we make it into a foam and steam it, and it has a consistency of nothing that occurs in natural dining in nature itself, then it, it severs the tie from <laughs> evolution, right? Because we should think about the things we watch, eat, talk about, listen to as ways that get us to tomorrow. And if we sever that guilt or non-guilt, then we have an object that becomes a very popular thing to consume. Right. I don't know. I'm thinking of cheese whiz. Is it cheese? I don't know. What's in there? Couldn't tell you. But it came out of a factory, so it's got to be good. Yeah, as opposed to a, a piece of cheese that is rotten milk, right? And like, ooh, this has a rind on it. It has mold this on is, it. This yeah, smells literal a little mold weird. on it, right? Yeah. Yeah, it smells terrible, but it doesn't taste the way it smells, and it's complicated. Um, I was thinking about juice the other day. 
Because when's the last time you bought a pineapple and ate it? Like a whole pineapple. I bought canned. I bought canned pineapple yeah, for yeah. cooking purposes, but I have I have not bought like a ripe pineapple. And I'm just wondering, like, is it just by scent? Do you take a, a whiff, and if it smells like a good pineapple, then it's you ready the to top, go. Um, slim Jim hairs, and if they come out easily, it's ripe. Mm-hmm. Okay, and if they're kind of know. yellowing and browning, it's it's good to go. And so I bought one because I was like, you know, I can't go. Cannot go another minute without buying a whole pineapple. And I bought it and I cut it and it was awesome. It tasted great. It was ripe. And it got me thinking because I was with somebody who had never had this is crazy. They were in their mid twenties, New Yorkers who had never had pineapple in that state before. Only canned pineapple and pineapple juice. So they were like, Oh, I've never had pineapple like this. It's not as sweet as I thought it would be and i'm like oh that's interesting because you know fruit is kind of better for you as a whole food than it is as a juice right but i was thinking about all the steps it takes to enjoy a piece of fruit and i'm like i went to the key food i looked for a ripe one i found a ripe one i brought it home i cut it and i ate it i am the hunter and gatherer and then I'm like, oh, it'd be really cool to grow some fruit maybe and eat it, but I just don't care enough. You kind of figure out where your line is in terms of that process. There are different processes, processes. you can trust. Yeah. Well, all right. Let's, is it basketball time? God damn it. It sure, it sure is. And for the last few years, the Knicks – have trusted the process. It's not the slogan. That's for the 76ers. That's Thank for you. Joel Embiid. Yeah. But the Knicks fans have trusted their process, and now it's led here. As of last Friday night, the Knicks have, I guess, agreed in principle, what we can say. I don't think it's official because of salary cap apron issues. As of Monday, apron strings it is need to be tied. complicated. They need to sign and trade players that are not even in America. But... It appears this will work out, and it's sending Carl Anthony Towns, the multi-time All-Star, best shooting big man of all time from the Minnesota Timberwolves, over to the Knicks in exchange for Slam Gennaro, Dante DiVincenzo, and multiple-time All-NBA player and Julius Randle. And the Detroit Randall. Pistons protected pick, Andrew, number thirteen protected pick. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a garbagey pick, so it probably well, we, won't convey as a we first. Gave, we had the rights to Jalen Duran and traded him, I believe, to the Pistons for that pick. Duran would have solved this need, but let's get to the meat of the topic first. Carl Anthony. So I want you're the you're the resident Knicks fan. I love the let's team. Let's hear it. All right, we're done. Done. Moving along. I don't know. I, Good, win more games, become thinner. Um, everything everyone has written on social media that if you're listening to it now is probably various degrees of correct. Um, Carl Anthony Towns is an underrated top 10 potential ceiling player who had to take a backseat to Gobert statistically and the rise of Anthony Edwards. He is the best stretch of all time, probably. Arguably. That's good enough. Um, he's going to help the team. World Wide West has been working on this for eight years with his Kentucky connection. Um, the trade is, sadly, respect to Julius Randle, who this pod has always liked, who put him in the, in the joy of basketball, that spent more time on that illustration. Those interns really love Julius Randle. But the player that I lament leaving most is Slam Gennaro. On this pod, when he was scoring 40 points at times, I was like, this guy might be the best or second best player on the team. And he's not a superstar in NBA terms. But he is so good on such an affordable contract that he is the jewel of this roster. Because you can slot him in in multiple situations and positions and he can carry the fucking team he hit the most memorable shot whatever it's just one shot 
of Nick's lore since Jeremy Lin in Toronto. Bang, bang. It was double incredible. Bang. Rumor is he didn't like Mikhail Bridges coming over because he wanted to have more playing time, which I kind of like agree with. Dante DiVincenzo should have been playing more. He is a good player who does things in the margins that win games. Carl Anthony Towns is a primary player who's not asked to do things in the margins that will win them more games, but they become less lovable and less interesting. That sounds about right. I mean, to me, and, and we may have talked about this at the end of the next season, whether it was on the pod or in person, whatever. I believe we had this discussion that there was going to be a fork in the road and it was going to come down to, are the Knicks content with playing this out? Keep the vibes the same. You know, fan base loves this team and ride it as far as it can and say, we believe in these guys. We believe in the culture. Let, let's try to win a chip with this Villanova five with Randall. Let's try to take this as far as it can go. And maybe there's a 5% chance of a title over the next two or three years, you know, as this, as they're in their prime, may, maybe that's what it is. That maybe five is too high, but there's a, there's a chance. It's very slim, but if you can do it with this team, you'll go down to Nick's lower as the most beloved team of all time, but it's really unlikely. Or you can say, we're going to create a moment where it all went wrong. We're going to, we're going to put that into existence. So if this next team does not win a title over the next three years, which it yeah. probably won't because winning a title is hard. There's a 51 to won't. 99%. That's chance just the reality. Have. The reality is they probably will not win a title. And that's not a commentary on how well the roster is built. It's hard to it's win It's just title. that the yeah. reality is it's hard to win titles. There's injuries. There's bad matchups. Someone on an opposing team Celtics. goes on They're a still crazy heater for, for three Tatum's days. First. Yeah. Whatever. When will the Celtics with this loaded Trust roster, when will they get their chip? But again, Knicks may not win. So in all likelihood, a couple of years from now, people will say, Man, they just kept that Knicks team together. They were building something. It, it wasn't until that goddamn Carl Anthony trade that messed up the culture. It messed up the vibes. I'm just saying this, this, this is a good possibility that that will be conversations in a few years. That, you know, on, on September 28th, or whatever, 26th, 27th, whatever it was, at Friday afternoon, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, that's when the Knicks lost their way. They got greedy. They saw the, the shiny object. They saw the superstar and they reverted to their Knicks gonna Knicks ways. They went and got the $50 million max contract guy instead of their Nova five and it fucked this everything is- up. And that may be true, except for the fact that now the Knicks can win a chip. They actually have a legitimate chance as good as almost anybody in the league. Maybe not as the highest, 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 but they're right there. This is the best chance the Knicks have had to win a title in our like so lifetime, this, or at least since you know those Ewing teams are going up against the Bulls. Or this is my Eric Adams question: As baseball fans watch the A's evaporate into thin fan air this week, what do we want from our thing, our hobby? the The Villanova Knicks, which is funny. Flaming out in the conference finals or Carl Anthony Towns, not a beloved player by any means in the NBA, losing in the finals. Uh, conference finals, you know, like, do we, do we want to lose with the team we love or do we want to lose less with the team that's less interesting? And I think Knicks fans and myself were bummed that Dante DiVincenzo left. And I think I'm not as bullish as you are. I, I think this team is good with Carl Anthony Towns. I do not think they're in the tier of championship with everyone else. Obviously, injury, health, everything. They're not in the Nuggets tier. They're not quite in the, the Sixers tier yet. Um, but they're good. Um, and 
uh, their bench is extremely suspect. The first guy off the bench, the first guard off the bench is Deuce McBride. And the first big off the bench is Presa Sachua. That's not good. There's more work to do, right? Um, bef- well, this is this is true. It's not a good build. I mean, they... This is, I agree. They, there's work to be done. I think talent-wise, they're as good as anybody. Oh, sure. You know, Carl Anthony Towns I mean, is the best player. I, I posed this question to you via text. Is he the best player the Knicks have ever acquired via trade? And is he the best player in New York right now? In the modern era, I would say that he is the best, except for with the caveat of Melo. The when they the acquired him, he was still in his like mid-20s. Not and as good as Cat, though. He was viewed as... Well, I was saying his per- the perception of him was being a top 10 player. The current perception of Cat is not being a top exactly. 10 player. Exactly. But those perceptions may somewhat be incorrect. Exactly. Although Cat hasn't been quite as good and he's had some injuries it's lately. Yeah. But I mean, in terms of, in terms of what both of those guys do, which is primarily volume scoring, ISO scoring and rebounding. I'm just talking about cat and, and mellow. This is two guys. You could certainly make the argument that cat's efficiency and the fact that he's offering shooting from like a legit seven footer and elite rebounding are better comparatively to the modern NBA than exactly. what Melo was doing. In, when in his when era. people online were comparing Randall's stats in a vacuum to Cat's stats, and they were like kind of like in the same world, I think we were getting lost in the sauce because Randall's six eight and kind of a ball stopper, and Cat is kind of a fluid seven footer, which is a big difference. Uh, if Mikael Bridges can catch and shoot. Him being taller than DiVincenzo, big deal, right? The Knicks got bigger. They, in a vacuum, they swapped out Randall for a taller guy and DiVincenzo's minutes for a taller guy. That is a good thing. Right. I mean, you look at teams like Boston, OKC, Knicks. I mean, they're really putting a thumb in the eye of the whole small ball idea. Which is just one guy. You know, these teams are... I'm saying these, these teams are enormous. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, one thing I will say is that to me, when you look at the Bridges trade and how much they gave up for him and how much dedication <laughs> they had to talent at like the two, three, four, you know, they had five starters for three spots or, or five starting caliber players for three spots. So if you were going to have Mitch on the court, and obviously Brunson's on the court, you had to choose between those other guys. If you gave up six first rounders Five, for Bridges, yeah. he's on the court. And if you paid OG yeah, forty, yeah. whatever, forty five million dollars for OG, then he's on the court. So you were going to be choosing between three guys, and it was going to be Hart, Randall, and Dante. So two of those guys, you could argue, if Hart's on the court, we're going to be on the bench anyway. If you were going to have Mitch at the five. So when you look at it in that perspective and you're like, well, instead of having this daily debate about who should be on the court down the stretch and, you know, are we going to ride the hot hand? Is it going to be metrics based, matchup based, gut based? Is it Thibs just riffing? Which of these guys gets on the court? Consolidating the two guys who arguably may have been on the bench in those moments into an all NBA player who now is at the center spot. It's a great consolidation of talent. You know, to have that spread over basically eight really good players or seven really good players and just turn that into five really good players, I think that makes sense from like an optimization standpoint. Because as beneficial as a bench is for, you know, especially with withstanding injuries, all that stuff. But if push comes to shove and you've got your best five on the court, that's like 80% of your top talent. Now they've pushed it in. Like 100% of our best players are going to be on the court when the game is decided. I think that matters. I, I, I respect that. I, I, don't, I don't think it matters as much to me personally, just because knowing what huge role injuries play in the NBA. 
And mm-hmm. I don't think any team should assume their five best players are going to play a lot. One of those players will go down and building a team must have contingency options, right? So the Knicks went from a pretty deep team, arguably the deepest, and they were going to go all wing. They were going to out wing you. Like, that's interesting. This is less interesting, but probably better if everyone's healthy. I agree. Consolidating to a stretch five is good. All stretch fives in the league, if if I'm not mistaken, are all injury prone. It is just a position and a game that doesn't do them any favors. Chet, Anthony Davis. um, I'm trying to... I wouldn't call Anthony Davis a stretch five, but I know what you mean. He's a, a mobile spacer, five. A big spacer. Um, but he can't shoot. Oh, he, he used, I mean, he won a championship because he was on fire, you know, for a week. Yeah. I, well, I mean, that, that year, um, yeah, yeah. But uh, Carl Anthony Towns with Mitch, if he comes back in two or three months, great. Um, I don't know if we want to get into the assets that went. You mentioned those, all those draft picks that went into Mikhail Bridges. Allegedly, that made Dante DiVincenzo upset because it, t- it was taking his minutes. I don't know whether to believe that or not, but it's convenient for Knicks fans to sever that that way. But that creates a kind of butterfly effect where then you ask yourself if you're going to consolidate. And then Mitch goes down and it's like, we've been thin at the five forever. Towns was playing the four last year, and that was the best version of the Timberwolves. Gobert is awesome. So it's hard to just say Towns moving to the four made them an elite team. But it happened. He played most of his minutes at the four in in the last two years. Um, And that's where he kind of was the most dangerous offensively, in my opinion. But um, the Knicks gave up an extraordinary amount of their savings in i think a total of six number one draft picks some protected some not five not i believe for this team that still doesn't have a top 10 player maybe and has no bench i mean i don't find the bench that incredibly worrisome only because if mitch comes back they're talking about shopping him, but whatever. If he comes back, then you could bring him off the bench or you could put him at the five and, and cat at the four. Clearly, he's comfortable playing with a non-shooter. Like and then Hart Gobert, moves to the bench. And they had an elite defense. And Hart moves to the bench. You've got Deuce at the bench. Uh, again, it's not perfect, but you need, four, you need four guys, really. You can't. You don't need to go in the playoffs with seven guys that you can play. You need four guys that you're willing to put on the court, basically, in case of an injury or two, in case of foul yeah. trouble, whatever. You, but you don't need that many. So if you, if you go into the playoffs and you've got, if you've got two right now, and then maybe, you know, campaign or Colac, one of them becomes playable as a backup point guard, especially when you know Brunson's going to get 40 minutes. His hand is anyway. not healed yet. Then, you know, maybe not. But I, I just mean... I don't think having two very good players on your bench, which would be the case if you have, to me, I think Deuce is very good. Oof. If you have Deuce and Hart or Deuce, Deuce and Mitch, yeah. I think that's better than like anyone on the Sixers bench by I'm far. I'm not talking about the Sixers yet, but like for another episode. I just think, I just think having Deuce and Hart or slash Mitch, one of the two, is like a pretty good start for a bench. There just aren't that many good teams but- that have... You've made the leap into assuming they're going to get healthier instead of not healthier. Like they're just going to add Mitch. I'm, I'm, I would bet the opposite happens. Brunson's hand allegedly is not quite right yet. Mitchell Robinson, would you be surprised if they were like, it's not healing right? He's going to miss the season, which is what happened at the end of last season. No, Cat has had his. Would you be surprised if Cat's knee tweaked a little bit, like? There's a huge amount of risk with this kind of this kind of consolidation with the caps with the cap and with talent. And what I really enjoyed about the Knicks, even though I was very very lukewarm on the McHale trade, not because he's not a good player, it's because of what they sent. But 
just with their roster. I was like, this is interesting. No other team is quite doing it this way. Now they're just doing what the Sixers are doing. Right. I mean, I thought the writing was kind of on the wall only because it it seemed counterintuitive to have that much depth. Ah, but almost. they had the depth. They didn't need to do any of this. Right? Like, I mean, do you do something or not? For years, I thought the Knicks should just do nothing and draft and draft and draft. Until they got R.J. Barrett, I'm like, you have to trade him and start doing something because now he's on the clock. Um, I didn't think the Knicks were on the clock four days ago. No, I, I didn't either. I just feel like if you knew Mitch was healthy, maybe you see how it works. I don't know if this was sped up because of Mitch's injury. Oh, it seems like it may have been. Because, but you should have assumed that. You know, Capello was the rumored player, Aiton, whatever. Those draft picks that went to the Nets gets you a Clint Capella. Two number ones get you Clint Capella. That's a, even a lot for him. Yeah, I don't even think you have to I give agree. up. Two, and two we two haven't even mentioned Julius Randle, right? Who ends up being the sweetener in this deal, in my opinion, which is really weird. I think Cat is pretty much an automatic All NBA East player, um, player in the East, just because of the, his usage. He doesn't have to play next to Gobert and Edwards or whatever. But Julius Randle didn't get a chance to play with. Mikhail Bridges and these three guys, these four Villanova Catholic school guys. I would like to have seen that. I don't think there was any rush Um, to deal him because he was looking healthy. That's all. uh, Look, I I like Randall. I'm I'm with you. Um, I was not in the trade Randall chorus. I do think looking at the lineups that they had, you would have been confronted by either having Randall coming off the bench late in games, coming off the bench to start games, or have Hart on the bench, or have DiVincenzo on the bench, or have Bridges on the bench. Like Again, I just thought the math didn't work, and that's why I, this trait makes sense to me. This is not to diminish the value of having depth and the, you know, the inevitability of injuries. This is all true, but I just meant... It was unsure what Randall was going to be doing for the Knicks this year. So I would have liked to see him play with them, and I think they would have been a lot better. But once Mikel was there, something had to give at some point. And this is what it was. you know. But I think the Knicks fans who were very tough on him and I thought criticism, criticized him unfairly, moaned about his attitude or his effort when the guy was playing hurt and he clearly has a good motor. He plays hard and now are eulogizing him. Oh, Randall, you helped build this thing back up. I'm like, you are not upset that he got traded at all. You're doing a performative mourning for him. You're so glad he got traded. If you weren't happy he got traded, you would be bitching about the trade. You're just, oh man, I wish you could have been here for this. And it would have been nice to see him do that. But no one's like, are you fucking kidding me? You traded Julius Randle? You traded Dante for this, this, this fat bitch? Like this, this, this guy who's like, cat. I'm like, this is not me. This is me being a fictional Knicks fan. But they aren't. Like, oh man, it's too bad Julius won't be here for this. Here's your bags. Here you go. Oh, oops, looks like you forgot something in the corner of your apartment, Julius. I, uh, I'm just going to throw it in your trunk as you go. Yeah, you need gas money? It's just so sad to see you leave. One part of me is like sports fans are the the worst. <laughs> bring out the Sports brings out the worst in people. The Knicks bring out the worst in people, myself included for sure, because they're doing the the contrarian thing you're talking about or the the ironic thing that you're talking about. But another part of me is like, and we've talked about Knicks fans hating Julius Randle 
irrationally for so long. He's a good player. He might not be the best player the Knicks have ever rostered at, at the four, but he's an all NBA player who plays hard and has struggles, but it's very good. And even certain podcasters who are like, I've always loved him. I've been on their pods and they're like, if only he could score 20 and 10. I'm like, that's literally his average right now. But the other part of it, but his is a but his is yeah, a shitty twenty and ten, not, not him, a good not twenty him. and ten. And of course, he's not. When he came over, he was not a sexy player, right? Like no one coveted Julius Randle, so he he suffers from kind of that. But at first, I saw people eulogizing Julius Randle. I was like, oh, these hypocrites. And then I was like, you know what? I like when people are nice, and I don't believe these Knicks fans, as far as I can read their tweets. But hey, it's better than being like, we're done with him, out of here. I'm like, this is what I want. Some respect for a player I kind of really liked. I hear that. That makes sense. Um, Not to like defang an interesting, delicious take, which would be Knicks fans are the fucking worst, man. It is like a bunch of players, to borrow a Clydeism, who don't know. I mean, a bunch of fans who don't know how to handle prosperity. When things go good, we get ugly. So, cat on the Knicks. Is that what's a disappointment for? Doesn't have to be you. You're a, you're you know you may think differently from Knicks Nation. Is anything short of the finals a failure? Is Eastern Conference Finals is that is that okay? I mean, if they're all healthy, Eastern Conference. If they get bounced before the Eastern Conference, that sucks. If they make it to the Eastern Conference and lose, I think it's like, wait till next year. Maybe we can add one more piece. We're one, one year of Kolik away from getting there. Um, this is exciting. It's funny how with yeah. the East, is it, is, I like it. I mean, I, I like the deal. I think Cat's great. Let's go. He's underrated. I don't give a fuck um, about Villanova. Let's go. No, I, but I think Philly, Milwaukee, Knicks are all kind of in the same boat right now. They've all pushed their chips in. They've all got their stars. And two of them are not going to make the Eastern Conference Finals. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that's going to be a big deal if Philly doesn't make it. If Milwaukee doesn't make it, Giannis might ask out. I mean, Giannis... You know, if the Knicks don't make it, they're going to start blaming what happened on Friday for derailing the good vibes train. Like, Like, there's a lot of stakes in the Eastern Conference, which is... And maybe it'll be about injuries, and that kind of gives you, you know, an asterisk. But like, yeah, two of these teams, and I'm the Celtics as you know a potential champion, a team that you know could win a title at some point. Yeah, two of them aren't going to make the Eastern Conference championship, and two of them shouldn't, right? I I don't want to be the Nate Silver just reading the polls here without extrapolating stuff. Oh no, I'm saying, but shouldn't all four be allowed to make it? Couldn't uh-huh. we? Couldn't we put all four in? No, but what I'm saying is. Giannis shouldn't make it. He hasn't made the playoffs. He hasn't won a series in years. The The Sixers added Paul George, so I'm with you on that. But, like, the Knicks, the Knicks bounced them, you know? Like, there's no reason we should say, and I'm just being, like, a cold-hearted statistician about this. There's no reason we should assume yeah, the Bucks yeah, will get but... there because Middleton looks like he might retire. Oh, oh, I mean more that there are, like, stakes for these teams. Mm-hmm then they deserve to be there or, yeah. or you know, have somehow earned it or will earn it. The, I mostly mean that if, if, if these teams don't do it, their season is going to be seen as dismal and there's going to be ramifications in some quarters. Like for the Bucks, if they don't make it to the Eastern Conference Finals, I do think Giannis asked for a trade. Probably, probably. Although, yeah, I don't know. I don't know in, in what terms. Like if he gets hurt again then it's harder to ask for a trade. Right. Um, to- totally, totally. Um, I, that's, that's, that's accurate. It, it, the East getting towns is fun. Uh, can we talk about the Wolves for a second? Like what they got back and how they're mm-hmm. looking quickly. Um, I love it. But maybe I'm too NBA Twitter about that because I'm psyched on Dillingham and watching him grow. And I'm psyched on DiVincenzo maybe more than I should be because he's like, Kind of like a, did you know, gotcha kind of player, you know? Um, I heard because, and we have to kind of talk about the apron 
because Cat makes so much money, they were trying to figure out how to retain Nas Reed. And Nas Reed was heading was heading towards a big contract and they had to do something. Um, so they had to unload, they had to make a decision now. And Randall has a player out, so he can walk after next year if he wants. Um, and so does Gobert, I think. Yeah, and like uh, we've talked about Edwards ad nauseum here, but like, is he like a is he an is he a top three player? Because they're setting him up to be like, okay, we need you to drop twenty eight points. We need you to be the the heliocentric guy now. We don't have Cat anymore. Like, this is your team with a Gobert, who's like a super specialist, Hall of Fame specialist. It's an exciting team that's deep, but like they did this because of the apron, right? You know what, man? Fuck the apron. Of course. Who wanted CJ McConnell? Right. What are you doing? Beyond all of the ramifications for teams and the apron design and to have parity and create exactly these situations where teams can't afford players. And if they go into the repeater tax, they get docked first round picks and all this bullshit. It makes me not want to pay attention to salary cap stuff anymore because it's all invented, you know? So if, if you're going to, it's not like these things are set in stone, but when it had the feeling of it being decreed for a reason and you went into the nuts and bolts and seeing how this worked, it's kind of interesting. But when it just appears, it's like, oh, we just added in a bunch of stuff that's really onerous. It's not my job to figure that out. This is this is your little Byzantine empire. But this is why the oh, trade happened. You want me? Yeah. I know, but you want me to go in and learn the details of this nonsensical system you put in place with all these penalties for teams who spend more money? I won't do it. Just give me the details. I I'm I'm over caring about the salary cap once you're talking about the seventh apron of hell. I'm over it. And it's complex. You got player, uh, you got analysts on Twitter trying to map this out, trying to like create spreadsheets. And I'm like, this is not fun. Like, you know, at first. That's that's what I mean. Yeah. The, the cap used to be kind of fun to figure out what would work. Yeah. The apron stuff, not fun. Not fun. And the penalty is like, you're not allowed to make moves or you get taxed. And I'm like, oh, these aren't basketball things. Um, but the deal is not official because I think they're $8 million apart. The Knicks can't take back $8 million, so now Charlotte's involved. Um, it sucks that the Wolves can't keep Carl Anthony Towns, who they drafted. And then they drafted Anthony Edwards. They should be able to keep these two players. Like, if this is a roundabout long way of disincentivizing tanking because you have to like retain the stars you draft, like that's no fun either. Tanking is more fun than the apron, right? Of course. Because there's hope and strategy yeah, attached. The apron is accounting. And we always have to pay our taxes, but it's no fun to be like, I don't want to do that fun trip because of the taxes involved. Um, but I don't know. The The Wolves look good, though. I, I'm jealous of the Wolves build. I think both teams, both fan bases are disappointed. And both fan bases are happy. Um, uh, it's now on Edwards to kind of shoulder that burden and give the fans something that he may not be. I mean, to me, thinking about this from an economic standpoint, when you're a contender, as I think the Timberwolves were, if you don't believe that team as constructed could win a title, then by all means, blow it up, start over, be concerned about the various aprons and say, okay, we got to save money. We're going to let Kyle Anderson go. We're going to do this move and that move because we're preparing for a time after Gobert and after Cat, where it'll be, I guess we'll have Nas Reed, maybe Gobert, Anthony Edwards, and it's like a new look team with new components, new parts, and that team we want to contend. I don't know. I thought they were really good. They had the second seed in the East. They went to game seven, right? Mm -hmm. Against Jokic. Um, against 
they beat they beat Denver and then they lost to Dallas. You know, when Dallas went on a hot streak and they just didn't have enough basketball genius on the team. Yeah. I don't know. I thought that team was a legit contender. They they seemed to be a, a top five team. And to make this move, I, I don't know if they'll still be a top five team. I think the defense will still be very good. But they were a mediocre offense. They were number 16 last year. They were pretty good when Cat was on the court. I don't know if this team will have a good offense. I look at it, I'm like, I'm like Randall, not that efficient. Edwards, not that efficient. Where are you getting your hyper efficiency? Slam Gennaro. Um, well, that's what I mean. It's 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 Gennaro, and it's Gobert and 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 you know McDaniel's. I I don't know. I just don't see the components of this being an elite offense. Maybe Josh Minot will ascend to superstardom. Could be. And could be. Maybe Randall's just a placeholder for Minot. Um, I mean, should Randall start? Yes, Randall's good. <laughs> yes, Randall should. No, start. This is not yeah, yeah. not a question about his his goodness. We know he's really good. Oh, should Minot start? Well, I mean, you could start Nas Reed at the four, right? Uh, I like Nas Reed at the five. Yeah, you can start. No, you got to Randall. Randall's the better player. Mm. I mean, Nas Reed, Dante DiVincenzo, aka Slam Gennaro, are NBA Twitter heroes, right? Like we people are getting Nas Reed tattoos. We were thinking about making Slam Gennaro t-shirts, but like Randall's the better player. Towns is the better player. These are all better players. And I remember a few people on my feed when the Wolves were were main characters they were like should not as Reed maybe starter you know like can we not bring him off the bench he seems to be like we're finishing him with him why can't we start with him randall's better until proven otherwise i don't think that's untrue in terms of of basketball i'm just saying for that team well we don't know we gotta see i don't him, know right? we'll see they added two I, I i mostly mean I think they're both good and they could both be successful. I just would not say that, well, Randall is set in stone in the way that we would think about him in New York because it's a different situation. And then, and if Nas Reed was coming off the bench last year as a six man until Towns was hurt, in theory, maybe he is the, the starting four and Randall comes off, comes on the court as uh, the backup four. Awesome problem. Maybe. To have. I'm not Amazing saying. Amazing problem to have. I don't know. A problem that I want They're both the really good. Have. Uh, so they're, they're both they're both excellent players. And yeah. another detail about this trade that made me think about like I'm not done with this thought. I, I'm kind of stuck on it, but the idea of chemistry superseding maybe statistics, um, the role statistics had in team building five years ago, um, especially with the example like the Knicks or um, players who fit together off the court, and maybe I am. Assuming that when you have depth, you have happy players. Maybe this is an untenable theory, right, of mine to say that you want to go into an NBA season with a deep bench with starters on your bench. Because maybe those players sitting there don't want to be there. And that is an important thing to consider. And I think GMs are considering that more and more, the happiness of their team. And... And we see teams that aren't happy, like the Rockets, full of talent, who don't show as much promise as you'd think because there's something bad going on there. There's unhappiness. There's sadness, you know? Um, there's cynicism. And I, I don't know what Julius Randle or Dante DiVincenzo feels in their hearts, but it seems like they both want to be good at their job and be given a chance. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're Dante and you're doing that same math that we were just doing and saying we've got five guys for three spots and you're coming off a year where you started it as a bench guy and you finished it playing like 45 minutes a game. Oh, he's so good. You may not look at – it was amazing. You may not look at that situation the same way that, say, a Knicks fan does and says, well, we have all this depth. It's awesome. Right. We can bring Slam Gennaro off the bench and he'll play like 26 minutes. And he's like, no, I – I wanted to have another couple of big years and go and make like a hundred million dollars. Listen, like I don't want to go back to being a bench guy, making making 
you know, scoring 12 a game. Like that, that was so much more fun when I got to play 35 minutes and took 20 shots. That ruled. And I've never been able to do that before. Listen, I really like you, but I can't date you. In five years, if I don't meet the right person, I'll revisit you. I'll, I'll holler. It's like, cool. I'll, I'll be here waiting. It's like, no one wants Yeah, to. yeah, I'll, I'll be over here. It's cool. No one wants it. Hey, we'd like to, you know, look, you're great. I loved when we were dating, but I'd like you to go be like my uh, side chick now. Yeah, stay the same. Don't Down change. with that? Yeah, no, we'd, no, we'd, we'd, you were awesome as a girlfriend. Incredible as a girlfriend, but I just feel like you're better in a side chick role. Can we both wait and, to see if I succeed personally? And if I falter at any point, I'm going to need you. Like there may come a day when I have to go out for dinner <laughs> and my main chick has a prior engagement. Maybe she, maybe she falls ill from a bad oyster. I'm going to need you to, you have to be ready. You have to be, you, you, you got to have your makeup on. You got to be ready to go. We need you to step up when we've got a, a hot date, a night out at the opera those, and, and my main chick can't make it. Need you in those breakaways ready to sub in at any moment. And then play 45 be minutes a, a team, game. Carry the load for the... Be a team player. T- team player. God. Also, that vacation we had last year with my entire family where we met all my kids, that was great too. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, the only... Like, I was working on this idea in my head that Scotty Pippen, if we're going to take intangibles into consideration when talking about greatness, I'm like... Scottie Pippen let Michael Jordan be the best version of Michael Jordan that there could be. And he took a lesser role. His generosity and his, the space that he created for Michael Jordan to do his thing kind of makes him a better player. I know this is tenuous, but he was taller. He was versatile. He was long. Without Jordan, Pippen was a beast. Older, but still a beast. I'm like... How come we don't talk about that more? Here's Michael Jordan trying to erase Scottie Pippen from history. And I'm looking at Pippen. I'm like, were you the better player? Okay. Um, I know you've been trying to get at this topic for two weeks straight. Oh, for a month. And I'm just, I'm not gonna, I'm just not going to let you. I'm, you said your piece. Yeah. We're going to move on to talk about Zach Lowe. I wish Zach Lowe had more of those I'm, nuggets. You've been trying to you've been trying to bait me into a Pippin over Jordan conversation two weeks straight. You've been doing it on the internet. I'm just not taking the bait, Quo. It's not happening. I'm potting with an NBA centrist over here. You know, like you are you're, you're NBA. I don't even know what that would be. You're an M- NBA radical. Wait, would Manu Ginobili have been better if he was a starter? That team is better with him on the bench, right? He was the second best player on that team. But I don't think people consider him the second best player because he didn't have a total number of stats. Yeah, it's all in the joy of basketball. Too bad we don't have a Pippin blurb that would yeah, mirror yeah, the too. Manu blurb because we know Pippin. I mean, my Manu. Manu. <laughs> Pippin was a better sure. player than my Manu. Manu my thing with Manu was just I wish that he had gotten his own team. At least Pippin got his own team for a year there. <laughs> they were amazing for two yeah. years. Two years, and they were great. I wish Manu got his own team just because he really was James Harden before Harden. Got to the line, lefty, you know, uh, took a ton of threes, could pass. He, he could have been like a legit top five scorer, top five assist guy, I think. He could have been heliocentric in, if that had existed in that era. Also, Go. the way I read it when that was happening in real time, I was like, Manu wants to come off the bench. I thought of baseball. He's a closer. He was like, I want to see four or five batters and throw 100 miles an hour each time. I cannot throw 100 pitches and be happy. I want to come in rested and do my shit, but I cannot be your volume guy. It was one of those years, I want to say it was Tony Parker was hurt. And so he did have a prolonged stretch of 20-some games. And he's putting up big numbers. Yeah. He Like he... Yeah. He, he would have been excellent. Had him on my fantasy that, team. that task. Yeah. And yet, not um, as good as Scotty so, Pippen. I'm not doing it. <laughs> Scared. Okay. All right. I want to, well, I want to talk about Zach Lowe a little bit Dude. here. So 
after X amount of years at ESPN, Zach Lowe was fairly unceremoniously let go. And then we saw you know, an outcry from the basketball audience, especially on Twitter, about how this was emblematic of ESPN's descent into hot take culture and how Zach was you know, one of the lone pillars keeping the integrity of ESPN up and running. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that response? Like, what did you see from the basketball blogosphere after this was announced? Well, it was Julius Randle-esque, right? I kind of, I kind of got up in my NBA fandom feelings a little bit because I like Zach Lowe's pod. I like his guests. I listen to him a lot every week. What up, Beck? Always Howard Beck is on. They have a great rapport. He drinks one beer. We know all this stuff. Um, but then the outpouring of support coming on the heels of the uh, the Woj sentiment was like, oh, my God, what's ESPN doing? We, we became a dumber fan base by removing him from uh, his an analysis role because he understands basketball in a way like Perk doesn't talk about basketball that way. Perk knows basketball. Richard Jefferson doesn't talk about basketball in the way that uh, Zach Lowe was the NBA Twitter guy with Grantland and all this. So we had an outpouring of people being like, this is unjust. And I got into my feelings because I'm like, but you guys haven't been talking about him for years. He's been kind of evaporating on in our scene, sort of like a diner in New York City being like, I wish the diners wouldn't go away. I'm like, you should start going to diners, right? And like, Fat Beats is closing, yeah, right? It's like stop downloading music and buy a Fuchs Nickens 12 inch, an arsonist double. But like, Fondalum Records yeah. is right there. And I don't want to be like, I'm not a super fan, but I don't want to be like, if you like Zach Lowe so much, name his top five takes. But like, ESPN knows exactly what it's doing. The money's in broadcast and live stuff, and Stephen A. Smith. Everything else kind of doesn't matter. They unceremoniously split from Bill Simmons. Kind of didn't miss a beat. They can do this. Fan service is one thing, but they're a media company. If Zach Lowe had an effect that people think he did, they wouldn't make him like the fourth option on their daytime NBA show. So looking back at the recent history of basketball media. We could say that started with Bill Simmons. If we're going to consider this the blogosphere, for lack of a less cringe the, the name sports for it. guy. But Simmons, Simmons, he's the god. He he started this thing. You know, his approach was he was a fan who was funny. You had your pop culture elements to it. And it was incredibly long form. You had tenacity. Would, you, had, you had rhythm and tenacity. He was dropping you 20,000 words and was it making it clear that he was rooting for the Celtics. Like he really epitomized the form and created the format. And then you had Free Darko, which I think Shout out. was yeah. you know more hyper-intellectualized, more referential cooler, to much cooler. less mainstream much cooler to, to less mainstream things. It's like, okay, we're going to talk about philosophy, but also rap push a T yeah. and also, you know, contemporary art. It was just, it was just much more nuanced and more high minded than bill, but it also took away sort of rooting for teams as much as rooting for ideas. Mm -hmm. You were rooting for players and you were rooting for concepts and you're rooting for, uh, you know, yes, yeah, like you're rooting for conceits versus saying, I'm just a Celtics fan no matter what happens. Right. And then you I think Zach Lowe is kind of the the third pillar here, where he brought in a style of writing that was wasn't rooting for anything. Allegedly. Wasn't philosophical. Yeah. Well, I mean, we know he's a Celtics fan, but just he, he publicly kinda, speaking. Yeah, he kind of would let that get in there. Yeah, but I just mean he wasn't overtly rooting for a team in a way where he was saying he wrote an article about it. He I'm was no longer a fan. There, there you go. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I mean, right? Totally different approach. Yeah. 
he wasn't referencing culture or anything outside of basketball. You know, he wasn't talking about how, you know, this player is like Bubs from The Wire. Self-admittedly, he was like, I don't know about those movies. I have one beer, go to sleep, and watch tape. This is what I mean. He is a, he was a basketball guy. And I think his writing became more, um, more colorful as time went on, but his approach also would not have been possible without the rise of metrics and an audience who was interested in those things, because whether it was, you know, like second spectrum, whatever it's called, whether it's synergy sports or player tracking or on off, his were deep dives on micro trends, whether it's players or teams or the league in general. And they would be 4,000 words about the wizards pick and roll coverage. What's interesting is that these all converged at Grantland. They were all there. It was Bill, it's Zach, and then a lot of people who used to contribute to Free Darko, you know, writers and editors like Chris Ryan, Network. Like they were all in that room. And then I was trying to think about how Zach Lowe became this towering figure that was, you know, worthy of this kind of outpouring of grief. And I'm like, it's when the window of time when Grantland folded and Ringer did not exist. You didn't have player podcasts. You didn't have sub stacks. You had the crumbling of Sports Illustrated, Sporting News, and you know, old school Deadwood publications. Blogs. And Zach was Zach was really the god that there was that window of period where he represented serious basketball fandom on the biggest platform. He had a podcast with good guests. I mean, he he was T Mac in 03 for like a couple of years there. And then the rules of the game change. And T Mac probably yeah. is a different player now. And ESPN has been making so many changes since Skipper left. And um, the Stephen A. Smithification of that brand. And we love Stephen A here. I'm speaking for the pod. Like, he, there is a, there's a skill that he possesses that is one of one rare. And he's supposed to make you mad. And he's supposed to miss. And he's supposed to get your attention. Zach Lowe maybe has had to have this happen, right? Like, I think he's going to give us awesome content. But media can't change without casualties like this, right? And it is just a part of the evolution of it. Um, people are like, well, Simmons should hire him and that would be a formidable thing. I uh, That would probably happen, but I think as of now, the ringer hasn't. And I think the ringer's like, yeah, we should bring him on, but like we, this is not what we're doing anymore. We just let go of their, their main guy, their basketball guy, who was a Zach Lowe disciple, Kevin O'Connor, who was kind of like does the same things that Zach Lowe does. It's like I go into depth with every draft pick. And yep. I talk about pick and roll. I talk about their size. I talk about their growth. I talk about space. There's something for every NBA fan out there. But what really moves the needle is Shannon Sharp, is people with cultural cachet, with trust from their peers, and with a true talent for entertainment. Zach Lowe is a great analyst. I mean, also, what's interesting about Zach Lowe's style of writing was that he's a good writer, but his approach doesn't really require being a good writer. Mm. And his popularity and his way of, of addressing, you know, this, again, micro trends were something that could be replicated by, you know, guys who write for... Bleacher Report or The Athletic or whatever. Artificial intelligence. But what I mean is if you had access and understanding to stats and understanding of how basketball works, you didn't actually have to be a particularly engaging writer. You can sit here and say, here are the numbers. Here's what the lineup data looks like. Here's what happens when they're running a pick and roll. Here's what happens when he's in the pick and roll. Here's what happens. Like if you have a command of the game and, and the numbers, you can do – sort of what Zach Lowe does. You aren't as good as him, but the information is there. 
The irony, of course, is that the classic, you know, ba- basketball columnist, I'm not talking about Bill here, but the, the classical one, didn't really have to have that much of a command of the game or the numbers at all, but it was, it was entirely based on gut and flamboyance and being willing to write things in a colorful way that people would read and get outraged by or get excited by. Mm-hmm. And it's like, these are really two totally different sides. If we're talking about this schism of like, you know, living for the funk and dying for the mm-hmm. funk. I mean, I, I can't help but bring him into the Nate Silver saga. And I, I see Nate Silver dominated, like it was the Malcolm Gladwell era that you, you kind of alluded to, where the numbers were so, they revealed something, I think, magical for a split second that we were all interested in. And towards like the last three or four years, post-pandemic, whatever, I feel like Zach Lowe kind of lost a little bit of his tenacity. And some of that was trolls online, same Nate Silver stuff, fighting against people who didn't quite understand what he was doing. And what he was doing was kind of like in more of the spirit of written journalism than it was a statistician, you know? And I kind of felt there was a point in his coverage when James Harden requested a trade out of Brooklyn where he put his foot down. And on the pod, he was just like, I don't want to talk about James Harden anymore. I'm tired of him. I'm tired of the, the stories, and I'm tired of the debate. He could do whatever he wants. I will no longer be talking about him. And I'm like, he's lost some love for this thing. And I think fatigue right. is an issue. People lament rightfully their own memories and their own youth and their own experience with Zach Lowe. It seemed to me like maybe he just needs like a little bit of time off. He expressed his fatigue a lot. I mean, I also think that him going behind the paywall and I'm not talking about one that's $5 a month for Patreon. Like that's the kind of payroll Pays paywall for itself. that like you're making money by getting the merch early. Like that's a different situation than what ESPN was doing. It's completely different. Hey, I pay for ESPN. But the ESPN insider, yeah, I pay. but the insider, yeah. every time he would put up a, a link to a story, there'd be 400 people saying paywall i'm not paying for that 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 that's not a criticism of his writing it's a praise of his writing that people wanted to read it but weren't willing to pay for it yeah which is you know it's a odd backhanded compliment but i really did view it as people were willing to read it but they just didn't want to pay espn more money especially since you know people are cutting the cable left and right they aren't trying to add more services that they're paying to espn but I feel like that was a problem where you just stop seeing his columns with the same, you know, daily routine and people talked about them less. And that is not a commentary or a statement on the quality of those columns at all. They literally weren't viewed by the same amount of people. And that's also a reflection of where basketball Twitter was at that point, because when he left Grantland and Grantland crumbled, you had all the eyes from the Bill Simmons fans, from the Free Darko fans, from the the metrics heads, all trained on him. He he was the only show in town. And ESPN was like, damn, this guy's crushing it. We should try to, you know, milk a couple bucks a month out of all these people. And it went from there. And, you know, to tie this back into shows about corporate backstabbing and ladders, and maybe I'm going to contradict myself here because I don't know if I actually believe this, but like to make Zach Lowe a heliocentric journalist at ESPN, a huge company owned by Disney, it's like maybe pushing him up the ladder in a way that he wasn't never meant to do. And I I don't want to even mention his name here. Sometimes people are so good at something, but they don't become head coaches. They're not all Eric Spolstra where it's just like, how come he isn't the more popular than Stephen A. Smith? I'm like, because Stephen A. Smith, is a quarterback. Zach Lowe is the offensive lineman that you can depend on year after year that is crucial to your team. And like ESPN is a corporation. And at some point, if they don't see growth, they cut bait. Nike's doing this. Supreme is doing this. Um, 
every industry is kind of reevaluating how they are going to stay alive moving forward because they got motherfuckers like me and you talking into the void, taking up their space, right? And like the ringer has set themselves up to be a mini version of this corporate point of view. I look at something like Meadowlark and I'm a huge Levitard fan. He kind of, and this is where I, I'm going to contradict myself because I don't believe sports is art. I don't believe writing is art, but there's an artistry to it that has to be celebrated by the person on top at the top. If it's not celebrated by the person at the top, you're just in the wrong place. Eventually Zach Lowe had to go. Well, I think that point you made before ESPN is a media company. They aren't a literary magazine. Yeah. Yeah. So when Zach Lowe was getting tons of hits on his articles and they said, well, how about this? We'll put those behind a paywall and then we're going to turn you into a bigger star and you're going to be on TV and you're going to be this kind of character. And we're going to turn you into a Stephen A. Smith or, or, whatever we're going to turn you into on-air and talent different. because at the end of the day end of the day we're a television company so we're going to turn this guy who has this big fan base and he really knows the game and he's serious about that and he can speak with authority and everyone believes him he's got the gravitas we're going to turn him in, into a tv star and when they said you're beyond the paywall okay well then it's basically sink or swim as a TV personality in an industry where the TV personalities are guys like Kendrick Perkins and guys who are willing to go out there and say dumb things Mr. Jefferson. in order guys will say dumb stuff and, and, you know, hot takes. And that's just not who Zach Lowe is because he's foremost a basketball writer. Yeah. It, it's hard to assume everyone could be a number, every player can be a number one option, number two option. You know, like I love when players, Corey Brewer famously, just know exactly what they do well and do it. Like Draymond Green's a Hall of Famer being a third option on a great team. Um, I don't know. The, the idea of media changing is ongoing. It's not dead. Like print is not dead. Um, these media companies are not dead. They're all fighting for. If they cannot get the games, which ESPN has, the live games, then they're fighting for their lives, right? And ESPN has the game, so they don't really need much else. Look, TNT is kind of the the center of the basketball universe right now inside the NBA, right? As soon as they lose live games, it'll completely disappear off the sports radar. Maybe wrestling. You'll watch for wrestling. There's no loyalty to these things, right? No. Um we're not watching ESPN because they've given us great sports centers in the nineties. I don't really care. Um, so I think in order to survive, ESPN has to do this. And like, I would, I would be shocked if Zach Lowe didn't, I would be surprised if Zach Lowe didn't go the route of like Ethan Strauss, not with his point of view, but with his model, like I'm doing a sub stack. I'm going to get really into the thing I love, which is basketball, traveling to Croatia, uh, talking about my my family, New York City, moving back to New York City. And that might be the bridge until the media landscape presents another seat for him. Personally, I'm looking forward to seeing him untethered. I want to see what he really feels like writing about whether that's on a sub stack or whether it's on the ringer, you know, whatever, whatever outlet or platform he chooses. I'm eager to see him without the paywall, without the politics of ESPN. And, you know, maybe this is what he needs. If he wants to come back in carrying a grudge against the basketball universe, against the viewership, against the, you know, television superstructure, that's a Zach Lowe that I'm interested in. Yes. With his sort of curmudgeonly, ornery approach and his knowledge of the game and the purity that he clearly has in his soul for this sport. Let's see him 
let's see him rock. Well, remember what and yeah. and 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 like rage against the dying of the light or whatever. <laughs> the era you're talking about of the the blog era, the internet used to be subversive, right? The internet used to be a way for things to fester and to be seen and accessible by more people. So you had these subcultures, whether that be NBA Twitter or mute dance music or things like that, that had a room in the internet. That room kind of doesn't exist anymore. You kind of seen it with like Twitter and Elon Musk's intensity to say the least, um, and his his courtship of hits, mon- uh, monetization, and advertising. And um, I don't know if we can ever put the toothpaste back in the tube, but like Zach Lowe in, a, to, to borrow a 90s Gen Xism, like sold out, right? Working for Disney was not the dream of a Zach Lowe fan. But it was just the way the internet had evolved. I'm interested now, like Kamala Harris is going to do, I think just did a show with Matt Barnes and Steven Jackson for The Ringer. Right. I do not give a fuck about this mainstream ass content where you have Raja Bell talking about the finals. I do not want that. And, you know, there's always been the jock versus nerd debate. Personally, I was looking for Howard Beck and two hours of Howard Beck a week, you know, on the low post. So selfishly, unselfishly, I'm sad that he got fired. Selfishly, because he seems like a genuinely nice guy. People like really love him, right? I've never met him. I really like him. But selfishly i i want him to your point to go off a little bit and try to create another world that we can jump into you know what world you can always jump into andrew the new york liberty shop the the, the oh yeah the cookies hoop shop with the new york liberty tea one and oh light that's work. a world you can always jump into it's easy light work of the world. um and also a world of perfection andrew always every week Every week, yet another perfect pod. Cookies. I love cookies. I love cookies.